you remember the um, <clears throat> kind of the hinge verse of the series is found in Ephesians chapter 2, really it's kind of two verses together, um, and maybe even three. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building or house is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of God. I was wondering this morning if, Gabby, could you help me with this? If I could get some help from the shorties. All right. If, if you guys would be willing to help me out, Gabby, go ahead and set that thing up. I want to illustrate something um, for you and just be a way that we can involve. Um, go ahead, just go for it. Start with this one on top. Okay. And so any of the kids that want to help out, anybody for that matter, come, come, come on up, come on up. I want to give you something. I want to give you... Just hold on to it. What is that? What is this? It's a block. All right. Anybody else want to come up? All right. Noah. All right. Here you go. Okay, so what What could you do? Stay up here. 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 What could you do with that block? There are three things you could do with that block. You could put it on top of the, the building, right? And make it, what? What would happen if you put it on top of the building? Yeah, would it go bigger? It would grow bigger, yeah. Oh, you could drop it. You could drop the, the block, right? And just not put it there, right? You could keep it. Keep it for yourself. Is that your block? No, it's a, it's a church's block, so it'd be like stealing, right? Okay. If you kept it. Or, you know, there's, there's a third thing you could do. You could go grab other blocks off of there and put it in, in your pocket or in your hand. But for today, what I want you to do is go ahead and, if you need this, the stool, um, go ahead and put your block on top. Okay? Set it on there. There you go. All right. If you got your block, go ahead and get down. All right, who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Me. All right. Go ahead. Put it on there. Excellent. Building is strong. Okay. Very good. And I'm going to, Gabriella, could you just complete those with the rest of the blocks? And as she's building that, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to start in, in uh, verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their heart. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality. So to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. To put off your old self, which, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with his hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And in that may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. You remember last week we, we talked about this room within the house that we're moving in, and that is the living room. And we said to, to live in a living room is living a life at a higher level. In essence, it is maturing. It is growing up. It is applying the things of God and, and growing up. And we talked about that God expects those of us who have, have aligned our lives with Christ, those of us who have made the decision to follow Christ, to live differently. We talked about the idea of taking off our shoes, taking off the old things, and putting on new. One individual, Patrick Morley, said this. We cannot simply add Christ to our lives and not subtract sin. We cannot simply change belief without a change of behavior. This is a picture of repentance. It's an ending of doing one thing and a start of doing something else in its place. Today, in the passage that we're going to deal with, is a last part of chapter 4, verses 25 through the following. And Paul Paul begins to set up this picture between a, 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 a stopping of one thing and a beginning of something else in its place. Um, it's really important that we get that in life, when we stop doing something, that we fill it with something else positively. For instance, if we are in... The, the mode of trying to eat better. And we're saying that we're not going to eat a big bowl of ice cream after each meal. Right? And we're just going to just stop that cold turkey. It's important that we put something in its place. Because without it, that void, that ice cream calling void that I hear oh so clearly, yells at me. Right? And I need to have something in its place. For me, that may be having... I don't know, some type of healthy snacks, or maybe an apple, or maybe a mango, or something like that, that, that begins to fill the void in our lives, and living for the Lord. God doesn't simply want us to stop doing things, and just leave it there, because that can be, I don't know, like a negative, a downer. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. God wants us to be people of action. And God wants us to do positive, life-giving things. So let's look at verse 25. It says this. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. In your, uh, your sheet that you have there, it says this. Stop lying. Start telling the truth. Pretty straightforward. Right? Paul says, because of what God has done for you, and because of the change going on in your life, we need to stop the lie part of us that is there. Now, Satan, in, in John chapter 8, verse 44, it says this. He speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and father of lies. So what is this lying that, that is written here? What, is, what does it mean for us? And it is, it is several things. Well, of course, you know, when somebody tells you a bold-faced lie, right? We, we, we know those right away. We, we can see those right away, those, those bold-faced lies. And, of course, that is what's included here. But it's also a lie when we exaggerate, right? Uh, I love to go fishing. And we can have an exaggeration of the story, which ends up being a lie. I caught a fish literally this big, but we begin to tell the story, and it's this big, an exaggeration. We can tell about an exaggeration of our, our abilities or exaggeration of our accomplishments. Those are lies. Partial truths. Half truths, or simply withholding information. All right, let's let's drive this home. In our community, Satan 
enslaved our community with this issue. And it comes out in this terminology, don't snitch. Do you know, it just, it, it just it irritates me for real. Do you know that this, this, the, the, the phrase don't snitch is tied to, it's tied to criminals who were caught trying to get out of the punishment by telling on another criminal's behavior. Snitching is not calling the police when criminal activity is going on. Snitching is not withholding information when a crime is taking and appropriate authorities are trying to solve the crime. We become slaves to the code and end up living in a world dominated by criminal behavior. When we accept the lie that says don't snitch. And it's the criminal element, those who are going counter to the law, counter to justice, counter to everything of who God is, is telling you not to say anything. Now let me speak from my experience. Growing up in suburbia, rural white America, the law enforcement element was much different than what I've experienced living in poor, urban Gary. I haven't lived other places, but I know what I've experienced here in the past 17 years. And so, in my mind, growing up and in, in others who have similar experiences, mine, that the police were your friends and the police were the people that you run to and, you, and they're all for you. Right? I've experienced where criminal activity was taking place in my neighborhood. People were breaking into homes and stealing, um, stealing water heaters and gas was leaking all over the neighborhood. Extremely dangerous. And calling the police, 911, and telling them that this is going on and giving a description of the individuals. I experienced the police coming and seeing those individuals and letting them go. And then the next day, those who were robbing, the main guy confronts me and tells me that the police told them that I was the one that called on them. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a moment where you thought your life was going to end that moment. And it goes without saying, the code of the streets on what people deem as a snitch is they get stitches. And so I was prepared with the kids in the car. I was prepared at that moment. And God did a miraculous thing, I believe, in that moment. But here's the thing. That still does not give us an out when it comes to telling the truth. Now, within our city... And recently I had a conversation with a law enforcement officer in our city that I've known for many, many years. And I told him, I said, here's the issue. There are people who are scared to death that if they say what's going on, it's going to fall in the wrong hands. Now here's a beautiful thing. In our city we have anonymous numbers. Let me just get real practical. In the city of Gary, there's anonymous hotline, as well as Lake County for that matter, where anonymously you can give information on criminal behavior. As one who represents Jesus Christ, we simply don't represent Jesus Christ just for our own well-being. We represent Jesus and we stand on the rock to exude peace and justice to everyone we co connect with and where we live. It's not simply, well, they're not bothering me. It's okay. No, as a person standing on Jesus Christ and on the rock, we need to exude peace and justice. And that means that if criminal behavior is going on and there are safe means of which to do it, it needs to be addressed. Here's the reality. We may know people slinging dope, right? And my heart breaks for those guys and ladies who are caught in that web. And the lie that is, is told them that they can sling dope, get quick, easy money, which it is, and be Teflon. 
that nothing's going to stick to them. But I've been around enough personally to see one of three things happen. Either they're killed, either they go to prison, or they get addicted to the stuff that they're slaying. All of those are death. So it is within our not only rights, but our duty as a believer that we begin to minister to them. But also, that may mean letting people know the appropriate authorities that stuff is happening. As well, we need to put ourselves in a position of those directly affected. <laughs> it irritates me to no end when I hear people just preach the gospel of don't snitch until something happens to them and their family. And then all of a sudden, this gospel has tons of holes. Their cousin gets shot. God forbid he's killed. And now they want to know who shot him. And he needs to get justice. He needs to, we need justice for Boo Boo. And we need justice for Boo Boo. But justice for Boo Boo is the same as justice for Johnny and justice for Latori and justice for Susie. Don't have a double standard. Jesus is the truth, John 14, 6. God cannot lie in Hebrews and Titus 1, 2. It is what it is. We need to tell the truth. And let me just insert here. Um, in our culture, we tend to qualify truth. We have a qualifying statement before the truth we speak because too often we do lies. Like, on my mama, on a G, on my dead granny, what I'm going to say is blah, blah, blah. It's the God honest truth. Oh my God, this is the truth. Y'all, we need to grow up. The Bible says, may your yes be yes and your no be no. We don't need to have any qualifiers on a dead granny's great grandma 500 years ago type of thing to qualify with what we speak is true. Let your yes be yes and no be no. Let's continue on. <clears throat> and don't, don't sin by letting anger control you. Verse 26. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. The line there is stop being pimped. Start taking control. <laughs> Before we go too deep, not all anger is sin. <coughs> At all. Not all anger is sin. Anger, ambition, passion, and other emotions are God-given and their gifts. John chapter 2, Jesus exudes anger when he made a whip from some ropes and chased out the people who were unjustly selling stuff in the temple. And he turned over tables and scattered the money changer stuff all over the place. He was highly ticked off. Not all anger is sin, but sin is in what the anger is directed towards and the actions that flow from it. Peter is a, the opposite example when he's in the garden and, and the soldiers come to arrest Jesus. And Peter, out of anger, cut off the soldier's ear and Jesus is like, Peter, no, we're not on that. Peter wanted retribution. So what can we be angry about? You see, when our anger is in selfish things, it becomes sinful. When our anger is, we're hungry, and I gotta have my food right now. <laughs> our reputation, not having money, or having too much money, things, but when our anger is in the injustice of sin, in rebellion towards the things of God, when it flows from the fear of the Lord, that anger is not only okay, it is just and necessary. We should be rightly angry at sin. We should be rightly angry at injustice, at, at direct 
hurt and pain inflicted on others. But the Bible begins to say we need to deal with it. It uses this, this phrase, before the sun sets on your anger, deal with it. And I kind of struggled with this, this phrase because on, on one, one side of things, it's, it's a picture before the end of the day to, to, to handle something so it doesn't stay there. But it's also a picture of dealing with it before there's no more opportunities to deal with it. Right? Y'all know sometimes you get angry... And you just, you just like to stew in it. You like to marinate in it. Either a couple different things. You, you, you. Fear gets in the way to dealing with it appropriately. Or you just get the sense of power and adrenaline rush because of the anger at somebody, right? I've been there. Like, you just store that up like, I can go there. I can reserve this little part over here, anger at this person or this group of people. And when I want to, it can motivate me in some ways. But we must deal with it because not dealing with it gives Satan a playground in our lives. Because Satan's looking for an opportunity to set up shop. And anger is one of those areas that he will pimp. Living a life angry is sinful. You become out of control. You make poor decisions, hurting yourself and others. And quite frankly, you're just unpleasant to be around. There's times when I'm angry, Joanna will tell me, get out of the house. Go take a drive. Go to another room, go fishing, go for a walk, do something. Because, babe, you are extremely unpleasant to be around. We need to deal with it. I never saw you angry. Could you be like, <laughs> oh, I've been angry. For several years, and I never saw you lose your temper. Yeah, I, I have. I've got a long wick, but when it goes, it goes. Um, verse 28, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands and good work, hard work and then give generously to others in need. And the, the fill in the blank is pretty self-explanatory. Stop stealing, start working hard. So this, this is a command that is set up. And uh, of course, we know about a straight up jack move stealing, right? Where, where we just go and take what is yours and apply it to myself. Right? And I could go up to Brian and take his Nikes and, and say, man, I've been warning you about that for a minute. I'm just going to take what is yours and I don't care. We, we get that part of stealing, right? Of course we're not supposed to do it. But stealing also flows from laziness and greed. Stealing also is looking out for your own interests as king. And caring less about others. It's when your own feelings, your own well-being, time, wants, desires, wishes, and ambitions trumps what others present as a need. When it's you and your family become number one. It's taking. It's not doing what you should because you just don't feel like it. So someone else has to pick up your slack. That is stealing. I don't know that we get that all the time. I don't know that we get that all the time. Like with the kids with the, with the blocks. I gave them the gift of the block. And the block's purpose is to build the, the Jenga or whatever this block game is, right? And they had, a, they had a choice. Do they take it and ha hang on to it and not use it for its purpose of building the building? thus leaving a gap, do they use it or do they start taking more away? And if we were to flesh this all out and we had time to, you begin to see gaps all over the place and, and the building, the structure becomes increasingly weak. Instead, we need to work hard 
We need to do now what we know to do. It's the opposite of laziness and greed. It is diligence at work and, and it is sharing. It, it takes effort. If you notice, the kids, when they came up here, some of them came up on a little thing and they had to put it in and take effort to put it just right. The opposite of just focusing on yourself is having an outward focus and it takes effort because we by nature are selfish and self-focused. And no, it's not always enjoyable. And he goes on and says, okay, so if you're, if you're not going to just be taking things and put in effort, put in work, and that may mean literally to go get a job. It may literally be to do things that you know to do and not wait for someone else to do it. It may be literally not waiting for a command to do something, but actually taking it upon yourself to see things outside your own sphere and your own scope to see other needs and do it but its purpose is not just for yourself it's to assist and give others it's to share and impart know-how wisdom to others it's to set an example and it's an ongoing scenario if we were to do this and start taking all these blocks out Right? You just start punching these out and keep going. Keep going. And taking these out. If I were to keep pulling these out, what would happen? It will fall. It will fall. Why? Because it's unstable. It's unstable? Uh huh. Because it's wobbly. Why is it wobbly? Because you took them out. Verse 29. Don't use foul, foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. The blanks are this. Stop destructive talk and start speaking life. What happens when you throw... Um, to say throw some old meat in the garbage and you forget about it and it's like 80 degrees outside it stinks and if it's inside your house and you you you've been gone from your house for a couple days when you come back in your house or your apartment or whatever what does it smell like what does it smell like right this, this foul, abusive language literally means rotten or worthless. It's what happens when you wash clothes, right? Sometimes, I, I don't know if you've experienced it, you wash clothes and you didn't get right away around to drying them. And maybe they were partially dry, but they, they were in a pile real tight. And then they may be finally dry, but you put them on and they smell musty, right? And you just kind of like, what is that? And maybe, maybe, maybe you caught it later in the day and you take it off, but you still, that smell begins to permeate other things. You see, it's not only the words that are said, but the effect they have on the environment. Don't use foul and abusive language. It's far more than just simply a word. It is communication. It includes thoughts, Implications, reasoning, and even expressions. I could say I love you, but give you a foul look and give you foul gestures. And it wouldn't matter what I say out of my mouth, but all the other forms of communication would communicate something totally different. A question that we can ask ourselves is this, will others say I'm being helpful? To others by what and how I speak. If we were to give an inventory. And you were to give an inventory. And we would be able to ask people that are around us that, that see us. Would they say that, that 
my, my speech and how I communicate, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Or is it one that is taking out blocks from the building? Making it unstable. Am I cultivating an environment of grace and love and peace? Or am I cultivating a space where words and actions and expressions choke out grace, peace, and love? You see, our speech is supposed to be used in a helpful manner. It is the picture of building a building. Brick by brick. There are speeches to assist in encouraging others, to building them up, to making them stronger. Our culture is the exact opposite too many times, where it's about destruction, tearing them down so we feel better. It's about, as my wife talked about to me this week when she straightened her hair and She's like, man, it's really long. And as I was out and about, people were giving me these nasty looks. These ladies were giving me nasty looks because she had her hair long and straight and natural. And there's a sometimes a hate out of just hair. How are your words? Are they imparting grace? Let's continue on. And Verse 30, and don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved at the day of redemption. Stop disappointing God. Stop glorifying him. I've struggled with that point because some of it just kind of sounds really like, man, I disappoint God all the time because I'm just not, I'm not perfect. Yes, this is true. It's true. Our sin disappoints God. It's sorrow, distress. Don't grieve, don't bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. See, when we come to understand Christ and, and have him Savior of our lives, the Holy Spirit of God, God is spirit form, dwells within us. And so, even though we may not be around people, we may be isolated by ourselves and say things and do things and think things and and, and whatever. And it's not affecting anyone at all. There's no loophole with God. Because it's affecting the Holy Spirit. First yeah. Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says this. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. And let's knock out these last two verses and we'll... Be ready to go. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So stop hating and start showing love. I was sitting at uh, Park Shore uh, Dunes uh, when we were having a dinner, and sitting with Tyler, I don't know if Tanaya was there, I know Ebony was there, and I was asking them, I was like, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do we say this for us to understand? And um, one of them came up with this, I forget who. But, man, we need to stop hating. If we don't deal with anger appropriately, and timely, it grows to bitterness. And it's ugly. Like, recently, <laughs> I saw on Instagram that there's this doctor, she, she goes by the name Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> so some people like that kind of stuff. Some people are just like, eh, whatever. But she, on our YouTube ch channel, she shows... Um, the minor skin surgeries that she does for like cysts and other things that are growing underneath the skin. And they start out really small, but then they grow and they begin to attach and grow like a tree underneath the skin and they gotta cut and do a surgery to remove them. 
Bitterness is that way. It begins to grow and it affects. We think we can control it, but we can't. Rage, anger, harsh words, slander and malice. But we need to show love. When it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, malice, and so forth, the picture that he's painting and the words he's using is like letting a, 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 a sailboat sail away. Or if you made like a little toy boat and in a windy day, you put it in the, in, the, in the lake or wherever and it just goes away. Or you got a rubber ducky and you put them in the, in the river and it just goes away. Or you have an airplane in a very windy day, a paper airplane, you throw it and the wind just takes it away. But we're supposed to bring in, bring into place to actively cultivate tenderheartedness. It's being compassionate and sympathetic, full of pity. Defined not by what our culture says being sympathetic is, by, but by what God defines it as. It's being forgiving and showing favor. And to give it freely because we remember. That Christ forgave and continues to forgive us. This is something we need to constantly remember. Because there will be constantly things that will test us. There will be constantly things that will, will try to say, it's okay to be angry at this person because of X, Y, Z. And then we have to come to a point of saying, okay, whom do I serve? And it's not easy at all. I hate it. Whom do I serve? My right to have feelings and everything that culture and maybe even my family, maybe even my spouse says, man, you should just go in full barrels and just blast them. Maybe not literally, but maybe with your words or maybe with your thoughts or maybe with your emotions. But yet, God says, we need to do something else. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. We'll, we'll wrap up with this. I was talking to somebody this week about this, and um, it's, it's tough stuff, but it's, this, is what, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 18, and we'll wrap up with this. In Matthew 18, and this is something I've had to go back and continually challenges my heart as it relates to people. Matthew 18, uh, verse 15, Jesus is talking about drama between people. And he says, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If, you have, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Um, our culture says, well, if that person is man enough, woman enough, mature enough, has sense enough, they'll come to me. They know they, they did me wrong. Jesus says, if you know that they have something against you, or you have something against them. There's no out. You hike up your pants, right? And take the initiative to deal with it. Y'all, I'm, I'm standing here testifying to you personally. That is not easy. But it is godly. We're in the living room where God wants us to grow up. And growing up means sometimes doing things that we don't want to do. But we have to. And I tell you, God will bless your life. I'm not talking about financially. I'm talking about your, your spiritual life in greater ways when you become obedient, even in this area that is difficult, but it's right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for...